In this video, we're going to look at density and how to do unit conversions. So density is a ratio between the mass of an object and the volume of an object. So the mass we can measure using a balance in the lab, and the volume we could measure with something like a graduated cylinder. And we can take the mass of a substance and divide it by its volume. So let's look at a couple of examples here. We have a solution that has a mass of 1.55 grams and a volume of 1.96 milliliters. And we want to calculate the density of the solution. So density is equal to mass over volume, or sometimes we abbreviate that as as d equals m over v. So if we plug in 1.55 grams divided by 1.96 milliliters, and go ahead and take out your calculator and be plugging this in and make sure you come up with the same answer that I do. If you divide 1.55 grams by 1.96 milliliters, you should come up with 0.791 grams per milliliter. And remember, we have to round to the correct number of significant figures. We're dividing here. 1.55 has three significant figures, and 1.96 has three significant figures. So we're, our answer should have three significant figures. Density will typically be in units of grams per milliliter, as we have here. Sometimes you will also see grams per cubic centimeter. And a cubic centimeter is really the same thing as a milliliter. It's just a different way of expressing that volume. So if you have a density given to you in cubic centimeters, you can also write that as grams per milliliter. Occasionally you will see other units, but these are the most common ones you will see. So let's take a look at another example here. A block of aluminum occupies a volume of 15 milliliters and weighs 40.5 grams. What is its density? So if we take mass of our volume, we have 40.5 grams divided by 15 milliliters. And go ahead and put that into your calculator. And you should come up with 2.70 grams per milliliter. Again, we have three significant figures in 40.5 and 3 and 15. So we're going to round off to three significant figures here. So let's talk about units. So there are base units that we use for various uh, quantities or dimensions. And you should be familiar with the base units. So for mass, you might think the base unit will be grams, but actually we use a base unit of kilograms. Because grams are actually pretty small. A gram is about the weight of a paper clip. So oftentimes it's more practical to weigh things in kilograms rather than grams. For length, as you might expect, it's the meter. For temperature, it is Kelvin, not Celsius. So we're going to talk about how to do the conversions a little bit later on here. Time is in seconds. Electrical current we really don't use very often, so we won't really talk a whole lot about that. And the last one, amount of a substance, is mole. So the first four and the last one you should be familiar with. Electrical current, we're not going to worry too much about that because we don't really deal with it a whole lot in general chemistry. So the way that we make a unit bigger or smaller in the metric system is to use prefixes. And this is a list of different prefixes 
associated with metric units. The ones you will need to be familiar with are giga down through nano. The ones larger than giga are smaller than nano. We don't use as often, so I won't expect you to be familiar with those. But giga through nano we use frequently enough that it will be helpful for you to be familiar with those. Now, if you have already memorized some of these before, for example, if you know that 100 centimeters is equal to 1 meter, or 1,000 millimeters is equal to 1 meter, you don't necessarily have to use the exponential notation. Now, for things like giga and mega, and micro and nano, it's probably easier to just use the exponential notation. Because those, as you can see, have a lot of zeros in them. Now one thing to be careful of is that these exponents always go with the base unit, not with the prefix. So for example, if I look at nano, one nanometer is 1 times 10 to the negative 9th meters. Or if I took a micrometer, 1 micrometer is 1 times 10 to the negative 6th meters. So, now that we know the metric prefixes, how do we convert from one unit to another? Well, the way we do that is using unit conversions, and we use conversion factors to go from one unit to another. Some people also refer to this as dimensional analysis. I would encourage you to get very familiar with doing this and to start thinking about things in terms of a unit conversion. If you think about things in terms of a unit conversion and start seeing things as conversion factors, then problems become a matter of going from what you start with and lining up conversion factors to get what you want at the end. If you spend time trying to memorize how to solve different types of problems, you're going to find as we get further into different chapters later on that you're going to have a lot of different types of problems to memorize. So start from the very beginning, getting used to setting things up as conversion factors and using those as a way to go from one place to another. So for example, if I have the conversion 1 kilometer equals 0.6214 meters, I can write that as 1 kilometer over 0.6214 meters, or I can write it as 0.6214, sorry, not meters, miles. 1 kilometer over 0.6214 miles over, or 0.6214 miles over 1 kilometer. So I can write this either way. If I were going from miles to kilometers, I would want this conversion factor so that I would cancel out miles and end up with kilometers. Or if I were going from kilometers to miles, I would use this conversion factor. So let's take a look at an example here. Well, first let's look at how we set this up. We start with our initial units. We make sure our initial units are on the bottom of the next step, and our desired units are on the top so that we end up with our desired units at the end. So let's take an example here. We have a car that travels a distance of 241 kilometers. And we want to know that distance in miles. So if we start with 241 kilometers, we know from the last slide that one kilometer is 0.6214 miles. We have kilometers to start with, so we put kilometers on the bottom of the next step, and miles on the top of the next step so that kilometers cancels with kilometers and we're left with miles at the end which is what we want 
So I put this into your calculator. Now we do not use the conversion factors when we're determining how many significant figures we should have. So all we're given, the problem is 241 kilometers. Therefore, we can only have three significant figures in our answer. So if you put this into your calculator, it comes out to 150 miles. Now I can put the decimal here so that I indicate that this zero is significant, but this isn't really a preferable way to write it because this is not clear. If you didn't notice that decimal here, you wouldn't realize that zero is significant. Technically, you shouldn't have a decimal unless we're going to put zeros after the decimal when we write a number like this. A better way to write it would be to write, to put this into scientific notation. And since we want three significant figures, we would write this as 1.50 times 10 to the 2 miles. Now we only need to put this into scientific notation because we want the zero to be significant. If I wasn't trying to make the zero significant, I could just leave this as 150 miles. Let's take a look at another example here. We want to convert 69.5 inches into meters. So we're starting with 69.5 inches and we're given the conversion factor. We have inches to start with, so we're going to put inches on the bottom of the next step. And we're going to put meters on the top because we want to get rid of inches and have meters left over. So if you put this into your calculator, you're going to put in 69.5 divided by 39.37. And since we're given 69.5, we're going to round this to three significant figures. So you should come up with 1.77 meters. So let's look at another example here. In this example, we're going to see a couple of things about how we can make different things into conversion factors. So let's start with the one at the top. Gemstones such as diamonds are usually sold in carats, and one carat is equal to 200 milligrams. We want to know the mass and SI units of the 44 carat Hope Diamond, which is the world's largest blue diamond. Now if we look down at the second part of this question, we can see that we are going to need grams when we start the next conversion. So we're going to go ahead and convert the mass into grams in this first part so that we'll have that for the second part. So if we start with 44.4 carats. And we want to get rid of carrots, so we put that on the bottom, and we put milligrams on the top. And then we want to go from milligrams to grams, so we know that there are a thousand milligrams per gram. This way we cancel out carrots, and we cancel out milligrams, and we end up with grams. So, if you put this in your calculator, 44.4 times 200 divided by 1,000, we come up with 8.88 grams. Now, the second part of this question tells us the density of diamond is 3.5 grams per cubic centimeter. And we want to know the volume of the Hope Diamond. So we can actually make the density into a conversion factor as well. What this tells us is 3.5 grams per cubic centimeter is that we have 3.5 grams per one cubic centimeter. 
Or I could also write this as one cubic centimeter per 3.5 grams. So I can use this either way to get from what I have to what I want. So look at anything that you're given, any piece of information that you're given, and think about how that can be made into a conversion factor. And then we can use that to go from what, we're, what we have to get to what we want. So if we take the number of grams we calculated, and the last step, and since we have grams to start with, we're going to put grams on the bottom to get rid of the grams. So grams cancels with grams, and we're left with cubic centimeters. Now keep the answer you had in your last step in your calculator. Don't use the rounded answer because that's only going to give you some error in your ending answer since you use a rounded answer. So make sure you're keeping the exact answer, and then divide by 3.5. If you do that, you should... You should come up with 2.54 cubic centimeters. So let's take an example of a problem where we need even more conversion factors. So this question asks us, if you are driving 90 kilometers per hour and you take your eyes off the road for one second, how many feet do you travel during that time? And then we want to know how many inches we travel during that time. So let's start with calculating feet. We have 90 kilometers per hour, which means 90 kilometers per one hour. Now we want to, try to convert that into feet per second. So we need to go from kilometers to feet and hours to seconds. So let's deal with the kilometers to feet piece first. So we have one kilometer equals 0.6214 miles, and we have one mile is 5,280 feet. So if we take one kilometer, and we're going to put that on the bottom because we want to get rid of kilometer. And then we also have one mile because 5,280 feet. So we're going to put one mile on the bottom and 5,280 feet on the top. And let's make that one a little bit shorter here so that we have enough space. So now I've gotten rid of kilometers. And I've gotten rid of miles. I have feet, which is one of the units that I want. And then I want to convert hours to seconds. So we know that there are 60 minutes in one hour. And I'm going to put hours on the top because I'm trying to get rid of hours on the bottom. And then we also know that there are 60 seconds. per one minute. So, I cancel hours with hours, minutes with minutes, and I'm left with seconds. So when you put this in your calculator, you're going to open a parentheses, and you're going to type 90 times 0 0.6214 times 5,280 5,280 divide by and we don't need to put the ones in here because anything multiplier divided by one is just going to be itself so divide by open a new parenthesis 60 times 60 and then close your parenthesis 
Now this parentheses here, the, the 60 times 60, is particularly important. Because if you don't put 60 times 60 in parentheses, then what your calculator is going to do is it's going to multiply the first three numbers here, divide by 60, and then multiply everything by 60. That's not what you want it to do. What you want it to do is multiply everything on the top, and then you want it to multiply 60 by 60, and then divide what it got on the top by what it got when it multiplies 60 by 60. So make sure that you are putting parentheses here so that your calculator will do the operations you want it to. And when you do that, you should come up with 80 feet per second. And since we're only given one significant figure in 90 kilometers per hour in one second, that's all we can have. So if you take your eyes off the road for a second, you've driven 80 feet. So a little bit scary to think about. Let's see how many inches that is. We have 80 feet per one second, and we know that one foot has 12 inches in it. So feet cancels with feet, and we're left with inches. And if we take our answer from the last step, and we multiply this by 12, we come up with 984 inches per second. And if we round that to one significant figure, it rounds off to 1,000 inches per second. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about accuracy and precision. So we've been talking a little bit about measurement and converting units. So what do we do if we have multiple measurements? How do we know what's accurate and what's precise? When we measure something in chemistry or in science in general, we rarely only measure it one time. We usually measure it multiple times to make sure that our measurement is reproducible. What's even better is if we have other people who have made the same measurement and gotten answers close to ours because it shows not only can we reproduce it but that other people can reproduce it as well which lends, lends itself to the fact that our answer may be more accurate. So How do we know if something's accurate? Well, accuracy is generally defined as agreement between a measured value and the accepted or true value. So saying true value is a little bit ambiguous because what exactly is a true value? Well, the true value is usually something that has been measured multiple times and it's been measured under standardized conditions and it's been verified, it's been peer-reviewed, and it's been accepted in the literature as a standard value for that particular measurement. So if your measured value agrees with what is the accepted value, then your measurement is accurate. Precision is agreement upon repeated measurements. So if you measure something three times, and get answers that are relatively close to each other, then your measurement is precise. That doesn't guarantee that it's accurate, but it still can be precise. So for example, if we look at the three dart boards we have here. So assuming we're trying to hit the bullseye, these three in A are all close together, but they're nowhere near the bullseye. So this would be precise, but it is not accurate. B is right in the bullseye, and all three of them are in the bullseye, so this would be precise. 
and accurate. Our last example here. These are not in the bullseye, and they're not close to each other either. So this is not precise, and it's not accurate. Okay, the last type of conversion that we need to talk about is temperature conversions. So there's three units of temperature that are commonly used. One is Fahrenheit, which you're probably pretty familiar with. Those are usually the units that you see if you watch the weather. They're usually the units that we use on thermometers here in the U.S. Celsius is a more standard unit. That's the unit that's typically used by the rest of the world. And then Kelvin is the SI unit. So that's Kelvin is considered absolute temperature. So at zero degrees Kelvin, which is absolute zero, absolute zero is more of a theoretical point, but if we were able to reach zero Kelvin, then theoretically all motion would cease at that point because there would be no energy. So we need some way to convert between these units. The conversion between Kelvin and Celsius is a matter of addition or subtraction. So if we have our Celsius unit, we add 273 to get Kelvin. This says 273.15, but quite frequently we round off to 273. That's usually more than enough for our purposes. This unit you will need to have memorized. You will need to be able to convert between Celsius and Kelvin. And since we do that frequently, and that's only an addition there, then you will need to have that memorized to do that conversion. For Celsius and Fahrenheit, we don't do this quite as frequently, so you would be given the formulas for those conversions. So degrees Celsius is equal to 5 ninths times the Fahrenheit temperature minus 32. Now if you think back to your algebra, the degrees Fahrenheit minus 32 is in parentheses, which means you have to do that first, and then you multiply by 5 ninths. If we have degrees Celsius and we want Fahrenheit, we take 9 fifths of the degrees Celsius plus 32. So if you notice, there's no parentheses here, which means we do 9 fifths of the degrees Celsius, and then we add 32 to it. So let's take a look at a couple of examples here. We have liquid nitrogen, which is often used as a coolant for low temperature experiments, has a boiling point of 77 Kelvin. And we want to know what this temperature is on the Fahrenheit scale. So if we start with 77 Kelvin, we don't have a way to go directly from Kelvin to Celsius. Sorry, we do have a way to go from Kelvin to Celsius. We don't have a way to go from Kelvin to Fahrenheit. So we can go from Kelvin to Celsius and then go to Fahrenheit. So if we take 77 Kelvin and subtract off 273, we get... 196 degrees Celsius and then we want to convert that to Fahrenheit so we're going to use the formula degrees Fahrenheit is equal to 9 fifths of degrees Celsius plus 32 so we take 9 fifths of negative 196 degrees Celsius and we add 32 to that. So go ahead and put this in your calculator. And take 9 divided by 5 times 196. And make sure that 196 is negative. And then we're going to add 32. And what you should come up with is negative 320 degrees Fahrenheit. Let's look at another example here. We want to convert the following temperature 
This is already in Celsius. We want to convert that to Kelvin and to Fahrenheit. So if we take 39.2 and we want to convert that to Kelvin, we'll start with that since that's a matter of adding 273. 39.2 plus 273 comes out to 312 Kelvin if we round to the correct number of significant figures here. If we want Fahrenheit, we take 9 fifths of the degree Celsius plus 32. So 9 fifths of 39.2 plus 32. And go ahead and put that into your calculator and then round it to the correct number of significant figures. We have three significant figures in 39.2, so we should be rounding this to three significant figures which gives us 103 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, I'm going to leave you with this problem. Go ahead and work that out and see what you come up with in Kelvin and Fahrenheit for a cold wintery day, which is negative 25 degrees Celsius. And then we will get some more practice with this in class.